Welcome to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology. All right, welcome back to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, where theology matters. So this is our second and I believe last episode on perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints. I hope so. And uh, the last episode on the doctrines of sovereign grace for a while. We'll probably come back to it in a month because we probably need to revisit it in a month or so. It'll have changed by then. <laughs> we'll have all new theories, uh, new manuscripts. We'll, new manuscripts will be discovered. The Bible's totally going to change. <laughs> So last time we left uh, reading um, 1 John 2, 19 through 20, talking about those who leave never really were. Another verse, set of verses uh, that I think that also supports that, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, 23. And both of us, independent of each other, came to the conclusion that these are the scariest verses in the Bible. Because I preached on this one time. You're like, what are you preaching on? And I just said the scariest verses in the Bible. And you're like, Matthew 7? I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but there's, there's a high pucker factor when right, you get to those. Right. Yeah. Because. You know, these people are clearly deceived. They think that they are in the kingdom, but they're not. Lord, Lord. Yep. And so let me just read it. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we not prophesy in your name and in your name, cast out demons and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So first thing I think we should see is that the evidences that they are giving in support of them being in the kingdom are all actions. Um, they prophesy, they cast out demons and they perform many miracles. Just as a quick aside, those are all associated with the charismatic church. I'm not necessarily throwing the, no. my point was this should tell us that just because we see somebody doing something supernatural and saying the name Jesus doesn't mean it's valid. Right. right. And how then ought we judge their ministry? By the word of God, right. perhaps. Yeah. So do you have a certain church in mind when you're saying that? Nope, nope <laughs> definitely not. I wasn't thinking of anybody named Bethel. Okay. But um, j- just the general point is I, I, we, we have been having discussions like that online and people will be bringing in these subjective experiential mm-hmm. stories. And, well, I've seen this and I've seen this and they're kind of, you know, they're having all of this success and they're healing. And, and I'm going... Okay, one, I think a whole lot of the stuff that goes on is fake. I just, I just think it's, I mean, fake or, I, you know, so Sparky, if you're listening, Sparky, you know, he talked about, you know, some, when he's experienced speaking of tongues and his, and he described it as like a deep emotional upwelling where he kind of lets go of his emotion. Okay. I'm okay with that. That doesn't mean that it's something supernatural going on. It wouldn't necessarily mean it's something fake either. I guess you could call it fake if you're judging whether it's supernatural or not. I'm thinking of specifically, I saw a video a couple of days ago on YouTube of Todd White supposedly healing a girl by lengthening her leg, oh, which, I mean, goodness, the, is it is that not a trope by now? Right. Well, there's also one where I, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And so he lengthens her leg, fixes her back, and and... I wish he could lengthen my leg because I actually go to the <laughs> chiropractor once a month because yeah. my right leg is slightly shorter than my left leg. Well, and my point is, I, <laughs> if if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to call fake on that. Right. Even if it's not, that doesn't validate his ministry. What validates his ministry is what the Bereans did. Okay, we see Paul. They probably saw Paul healing, but what did they do? Let's check it against Scripture. Mm-hmm. That That is... So, and, and here in Matthew 7, we see people who, I, I don't think these are false accounts. Mm-hmm. You know, did we not prophesy in your name? That's huge in charismatic Pentecostal type stuff today. Um, I would say that New Testament, scripturally speaking, prophecy is generally the proclamation of the word of God. So I would 
I would push it more towards preaching than some supernatural prophecy. But right. did we do that? Did we cast out demons in your name? Okay, maybe, you know, maybe demons allow that type of stuff sometimes for the purpose of deception. Right. Um, did we not do many mighty works in your name? So, and Jesus doesn't go, yeah, you did. And you almost got it. He's like, <laughs> you were this close. Right. No, he's like, yeah, I don't, none of that mm-hmm. counts at all towards the kingdom. So, you know, my, my point here for all of our listeners is the only standard that we have in order to judge ministries is, are they faithful to preaching the word of God mm-hmm. accurately? Right. Um, Which and, includes doctrine. Right. I, I'm not sure what else it includes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we saw that meme about Furtick saying, we don't preach doctrine. It gets in the way of evangelism. I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, I, I really yeah. like the one. I think it's attributed to MacArthur, but it's, yes, doctrine divides the sheep from the wolves. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's know? good. I mean, yeah. it, it, yes, d- doctrine is intended to divide. Right. Division's not always a bad thing. In yeah. fact, I seem to recall Jesus saying that he came to bring division and a sword. Right, well... And just the fact that you say we don't preach this thing or we don't, in some ways, is a doctrine, you know, right. unto itself. Well, it's almost kind of like the, we don't do no creeds and confessions. Actually, you do. By not having a publicly published one, you just let everybody have their own internal creed and confession right. that's not subject to examination. That tends to work out well. Right. Or your creed is no creeds. Right. <laughs> we just preach the Bible. Oh, well, that's novel. I wish more Christians but, would have. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah. All right. So we've digressed a little bit, but I think we uh, talked uh, a good bit uh, about these. But we actions. haven't told enough jokes. No, we haven't told any jokes. Um, he says, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons in your name perform many miracles? I will declare to them that I knew you, but you left. Yep. Wait. No. What are you, what version is that? Is that the NASB? Because my ESV doesn't quite read no, that way. No, I, I misread it. It says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, again, it's not like he's saying, yeah, you were there, but you fell away. You, you know, that's not the testimony of, of Christ. It's, I never knew you. You were never my sheep. I was never your shepherd. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so... Uh, I kind of feel like saying that this is such an obvious doctrine from the New Testament that the onus is on the people who believe you can lose your salvation to prove it. <laughs> but let's not do that. No, let's not do that. All right. So kind of like we, what we talked about in the last one a little bit, we're not saying that a mere recitation of a prayer or going down an aisle, we're not saying that that is enough to then let you go out and live how you want to, because we think salvation is effective. It's meaningful. It changes you. And if you've been changed, the writer of Hebrews, probably Apollos, um, says that if you are a son of God, he will discipline you. And sometimes that discipline is just because he's maturing you and it's not necessarily directly for sin, but sometimes it's directly for sin. You know, we're, you've sinned, you need to learn how to, you know, walk in a more worthy manner. Um, and so he talks about, you know, us, God being a, just like our earthly fathers disciplines us. It's not very fun, but you know, after it's done, it works the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Yeah. Uh, another passage that popped up in my mind is so for all of those who may not have picked up on this, we've kind of mentioned it obliquely a few times, but Michael and I are part of a three-man teaching rotation on Wednesday nights, and we're currently teaching through First John. And I'm reading it every day, so I'm really kind of saturating my mind in it. Um, and there's so much good stuff in there, and it's so it's so wonderfully basic, right? Mm-hmm. There's not a there. There's some passages in there where I'm kind of like. This, this is going to take some work. I'm hoping you get those passages to <laughs> me teach. Me too. Well, me too, because those are fun. But right. there's so much in there where it's just like, hmm, that one's simple to understand and very difficult to implement. Right. Uh, or as Vody Balkum is kind of fond of saying, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you go to First John 5, um, 
he is yet again kind of showing this is what the children of God look like. This is how you can recognize them. And what I love, and this is what I said in my class last Wednesday night is, John kind of keeps repeating the same themes, but it's almost like he's holding up a gem for examination. And every time he says something else, he rotates the gem just a little bit, not a ton. You're Mm -hmm. not getting a totally new view, but by the, you know, by the time you go through all five chapters or really seven, if you include second and third John, you've, you've almost seen it from a 360, Mm -hmm. but, but each turn is, you know, just 10 or 15 degrees, Mm -hmm. something small. Um, well, in chapter five, he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And you and I would argue, you can't be unborn of God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Everyone who loves the father loves whoever has been born of him. So by nature, we recognize our own. Mm-hmm. And if you've been born of God and I've been born of God, then there is a natural um, love that's between mm-hmm. us. Okay. Here's how we know that we love the children of God we feel good emotions towards them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually not John's way to recognize I thought it's because it. we wear those shirts that have like the logos that have been changed into something that's Christianese. Isn't that how we know? Uh, that's not John's <laughs> standard. No, he says, here's how we know that we love the children of God because we love God and obey his commandments, right? So, so sometimes there's just really a disjunction between how we would naturally finish John starts the right. sentence, and then if you if you just have a blank there, you almost never guess. Fill in second. the blank. Yeah. Uh, you're wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there, there's clearly, when you've been born of God, these are the natural repercussions or consequences mm-hmm. of that change. And when you've been born of God, then you love God and obey his commandments. So, yeah, what we're saying here with perseverance of the saints is there is an absolute change that occurs in our life. It is a responsibility that we have, and it is something that God does in us. As Paul says in Philippians 2, it's God who works in you both willing to work for his good pleasure. And then, But it keeps going. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, which we would totally agree with. As believers, God has a standard of righteousness that we are to walk in. We will not do it perfectly, and we require the ongoing sanctification, which is mentioned in 1 John chapter 1, but... It's not a free-for-all, go do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And his commandments are not burdensome for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I mean, it just he just keeps kind of giving you more of a 3D picture of it or twisting it a little so you can see just a different piece of what it mm-hmm. looks like. But it, it's it's very clear in my mind that he is saying, this is how you recognize God's children. And if you, if if this doesn't characterize you, then you're not, and never have been a child of God. Mm -hmm. It's not this thing that you can go into and out of. Right. I mean, my son, my sons and daughter, my children are never not my children. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you, if you take the biblical theme, say of adoption. Okay. Once you adopt a child, they're not like on, thin ice and you're like you better not screw up today at school or you're You're in the doghouse and not my kid for it i mean it you're going back to the foster home right Right. i mean that that's absurd and in fact in the context in which paul was writing adoption in the roman sphere of things was as far as i know from my study there was no way to undo it Mm -hmm. there was no way once you adopted that person that was it they were your kid period yeah, I've so, heard of similar things where um, people have given an example they've taught about places putting in laws like when you adopt someone, you could not disinherit them and stuff because there's extra protection for people who are adopted. You know, it's just yeah, curiosity. All right. Um, any other uh, positive verses that you'd want in order to make the case before we deal with well, I, I think maybe, sorry, I think maybe we should talk about the four soils parable. Um, I don't even have the reference to that. It's found in a couple of places. I don't know that we need, we can read it if we need to dig into it, but um, there, are, you know, seed is thrown. Well, re- re- real quick, before we leave First John okay. 5, All right. verse 13, 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I would argue logically, if you have eternal life that you can lose, you don't have eternal life. John's argument is how do you know that you are a child mm-hmm. of God? And that's, that is a grounded fact that does not change. Right. Your behavior may change. You may conform better or worser to the standard, but you, if you can lose your salvation, then you can't know that you have mm-hmm. eternal life. You just can't. There's no way because who's to say that a year from now you wouldn't fall away and then you don't have eternal life. So if you don't have it later, then you really never had it right before. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I got distracted. There was a car. So we face a bank of windows when we do this show. There was a car driving by and I thought it was a guy's face hanging out of the window. And I was like, this is crazy. But it, when it caught the next window, it was a dog with its face. But it was odd. Sorry, I, I was got Ugly distracted guy, huh? there for a little bit. All right. So, um, so there's a lot of talk about this idea of perseverance of the saints as it relates to the parable of the soils. Are you finding that reference for us? I'm trying friend? to. Um. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. There he is again. Yeah. The dog must have switched sides. Yeah. Or it was two dogs. Two dogs. Yeah. Because I think the other dog was all brown. But we digress. Um, so what you hear in the background is Mike and I talking through trying to find the reference of the four soils. We weren't prepared. I actually ended up pulling out my cell phone to find it. So, as both of us knew immediately, right off the top of our heads. Right where it was. Yep. Luke 8, uh, the parable of the sower. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what the parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience." All right, so I'm not. I'm curious to hear if if you differ because we didn't pre talk about this. But I take the first three soils as not being regenerate. Is that how you've taken it? Definitely the first two. Um, potentially, I could see the third soil being a believer who isn't never fruitful. matures. Um, I don't know that I'd go to the mat one way or the other, mm-hmm. but I also. I don't see any way that you can force into this parable and and talk about, I mean, the only one that could potentially have lost their salvation is number two. And I think at at least from the context, it appears to be, especially when you cross reference it to other things like John six, it's somebody that has the appearance of being a follower or Mm -hmm. a disciple for a time, but you know, something happens and they're exposed for what they really were. They were, they were part of the church because it benefited them, not because they were truly part of the universal church. Yeah. And I think some people talk about this. They miss the point that the seed is the word of God, not necessarily salvation because they act like each soil gets salvation or like the hard soil never got it. But then the other three soils got the salvation. I'm like, well, it's not saying the seed is salvation. The seed is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the first three, it, it doesn't ever fully take hold. Uh, and so the second one is the rocky soil. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
um, they hear with great joy. So Ray Comfort makes a point about receiving the gospel with joy versus receiving it with sadness. I wouldn't, I don't know that, uh, I would press this too much, but, um, he's saying that when we are repenting and we're coming to God and we receive the gospel, most of the time it's out of, um, fear of hell repentance, bring, which brings us sadness and sorrow as we see our lives for actually what it is. Um, instead of a joy of, Oh, look, I'm going to get something out of this exchange. I, I'm about to, I'm about to profit from this. I, that seems to, I, I've never heard anyone else make that point. Um, but it seems to make sense to me. I don't know if you've ever had a thought on that. I've never heard that before, but it immediately what springs to mind is the man who digs in a field, finds a treasure and in his joy goes and sells all that he has in order to acquire the field. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've always heard that as being that that's the kingdom. That's what the kingdom of God Mm -hmm. is like. That is right. A believer and how they respond when they find the pearl of great price or, I mean, you know, so Mm -hmm. that, that seems to me like it's kind of trying to press a, a, a side point in a parable too far mm-hmm. into a particular rubric of theology. So, yeah, not uh, I don't know. I'd have to think through it, but it it seems to. I don't think that's the point of the parable. No, I don't. Th- I think yeah. I, I I well, he's let me stutter some more. Um, I, he's pushing against <laughs> the churches that are more consumeristic and, and maybe he's, and I'm totally with him. Right. I'm and so maybe, that. maybe he's using, you know, right sermon, wrong verse type of thing. But I, I, he's saying that all these churches where these people are coming down, they're happy and they're like, yeah, we got, you know, I put on Christ today and now I'm going to have a great life. I think he's trying to say, this is what these people look like. And then it bear, time tells that these people were never really believers and that he's saying most true repentance. And I remember, you know, at least it matches my own testimony when, when, while there was joy after the, the transaction was done, the moment of transaction, when I'm like, you know, when I see a man myself for what I really am, it's not joy. It's, you know, kind of heartbrokenness. At least it matched my my personal yeah, stuff. Maybe, but I think joy and sorrow can coexist. coexist. Yeah. I think sorrow and happiness. Did. Shakespeare thought it. Parting he said parting was, was such, such sweet sorrow. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You you tried to use that to redefine reckless at one point. <laughs> let's not <laughs> let's not go in the ditch. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think the point is that they received it with joy and then they walked away from it. Yeah. So the emotion, I, I would take that to be the emotions aren't determinative. It's right. how does it pan out? That's yeah. determinative. Yeah. And that's why I would for, agree for with me you. on the third one, the fruit never matures, but at the end of the story, so to speak, you still have a living plant. It's not doing what it ought to do, but so, uh, you know, th- yeah, they bring no fruit to maturity. So it doesn't necessarily say it's bad fruit or a bad plant I'm trying to cross reference it with other, I don't know. I get, I mean, yeah. you and I would both agree pressing parables too far is not really the way to go. So right. I, what's the point of the parable? I don't think it really matters if we agree on exactly what number right. three represents. But again, if we're looking at this as an objection to eternal security, I don't think it's talking about that. Right. I just right. think it's talking about this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Right. Yeah. All right. So I went out and searched for some objections to this. The The only really substantive objections I found, and if there are some that we're o- overlooking, please comment um, either on our Facebook page, which is Mike and Mike Theology Plus. Um, or on YouTube, or I, I'm assuming there's a way to comment on podcasts, but I'm not sure that that's the case. Maybe it's platform specific. Um, but I've really only found two substantive objections to this. 
and they were along these lines. One, there are stern warnings against apostasy. This is William Lane Craig. He says that this doctrine undermines the um, meaningfulness of the warnings in the book of Hebrews to the Jews to not fall away. That if we're going to take the book of Hebrews seriously, it has to mean that people can fall away from salvation. I don't agree with him, obviously. Um, and then he tries to claim it for Molinism, <laughs> which I thought was odd because he said, you know, hyper Calvinists are, well, he doesn't say hyper Calvinists, but he might as well say hyper Calvinists. Well, because in his mind, uh, Calvin was a hyper Calvinist. Right, right. Um, he says, you know, all these things are determined. But then they might say, well, God used those warnings so that when believers would read them, that they would, it would cause them pause and help them to stay faithful. But really, that is God knowing the counterfactuals of creaturely freedom and providing, you know, what they need in order to keep them faithful, with, which is Molinism. Uh, well, maybe. So does he argue for eternal security then? No, no. He's saying that those verses are used to help people stay faithful, but that you could actually fall away. It's, it's a, I, you can go find it. It's, it's out there on the interwebs. Maybe I'll, if I remember, I'll link to it in the doobly doo below. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think you can take those warnings seriously and still think that, you know, people who are believers are believers. Uh, I don't find that, that to be in, incongruent. Even when we are talking about the book of Jude, there are warnings against those apostates and really on, on how we deal with them and how to recognize them. Um, but the warnings are there. I, Paul, it's Paul that says, work out your salvation in fear. Fear and trembling is, yeah, yeah. Philippians too. Yeah. So uh, there is this idea of um, as we walk through our life, I think God calls us to greater and greater repentance, greater and greater, you know, selflessness, greater and greater sanctification as we mature. Um, I think sometimes our salvation or our uh, not salvation, but our faith, our maturity are tested so that we can see what's really underneath and be shocked by it sometimes and go, Oh, I need your help or, um, but I, I, I don't find that to be a convincing objection, especially given the clear teaching of other passages. Yeah. I'm in complete agreement. It, because the passages that do talk about people who have apostatized seem to say they were never part right. of it. They, right. they were, you know, that's what John says specifically. Jude says they were marked out beforehand for destruction. Um, you know, in John chapter three, it talks about Jesus not disclosing himself to the believers because he knew what was in man and, right. and Judas who was outwardly, I mean, he was the son of perdition or destruction mm -hmm. who was not a surprise to Jesus at all. Right. So, um, I, that doesn't hold any water. With right. Me. So I guess there's three, cause I, I listened to one on the way there. was so the one on the way I listened to the guy was saying, um, that the Bible says that you have to keep believing and trusting and if to be saved. Yep. And we're like, yeah, well, we were talking about that a little bit before. Yes. I, I don't know what follows from that. And that's kind of what we're saying. So it sounds like he's arguing against once saved, always saved. Which we're we're not saying that we're totally saying agree. that if you start living like the devil, odds are you're the son of the devil, right, or the, right. Or the daughter of the devil, um, and that you were never saved to begin with. Not that a believer can't have serious falling away, which brings us to our next objection: God provides a mechanism to excommunicate uh, church members. That's an objection. Yeah. So the thought was the it was worded like why would God provide a mechanism to excommunicate church members if you couldn't lose your salvation? Um hmm. 
So I think the thought was you have someone who's a believer. They start living like the devil that shows that they've lost their salvation and there needs to be a mechanism to remove them from fellowship. It seems like that idea requires a presupposition that church membership is an infallible process. Would you don't, yeah, we've discussed this before. You know, there, I want to be careful what I say, you know, we're not convinced that every single person on our membership roles are believers. There's people who give evidences uh, or testimony to the fact and, and they're not living like the devil. So, you know, you, you accept them into, into membership. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, well, but I, I would also argue, I don't believe that everyone who is excommunicated properly, according to Matthew 18 is an unbeliever. Well, well, exactly right. Well, that was the other point. You it's know. a mechanism for reclaiming right. by exposing a genuine believer by, by putting them outside of the protection, if you will, of being part of the body of Christ mm-hmm. at, in, a, in, a, in the expression of a local congregation. A true believer is going to go, this is bad. Mm-hmm. I, whoa. Okay. Uh, I mean, so it, it's a means... It's the discipline part of church discipline, right? right? It, hopefully, you win them the first time you go to them one on one and say, "Look, you done wrong. You need to repent." But the 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 goal at every stage is assuming that we're dealing with a genuine right. believer. The goal is getting them to repent of their sin and come back into full reconciled fellowship with the local body and with right. God. And and there's no. So you don't start that process hoping to excommunicate somebody and like, oh man, he repented. <laughs> no, but I mean, look, look how you, the, the classical example, you go to first Corinthians chapter five, where Paul tells the Corinthian church, guys, I was serious about this part, kick them out mm-hmm. um, and turn them over to Satan for the destruction. Yeah. But then you get to second Corinthians and Paul's like, Guys, he repented. Bring him back. Yeah. Like it, it's. Yeah. Um, I mean, the point is for the destruction of the flesh and the salvation of the soul, mm-hmm. and ideally, the salvation of both. That they come back into fellowship of mm-hmm. with the church. Um, so I, that that makes no sense to me. Yeah. Why? It, it's a mechanism to pure purge the local congregation of people who are unbelievers and giving evidence to that fact. And it's a, a way to chastise and discipline genuine believers to bring them back from a lapse into serious sin. Right. And Galatians 6, one. whenever I've talked about um, this process, I've always said that Matthew 18 gives us the process. Galatians 6, one gives us our attitude. You know, it's those who are spiritual restore such a one and, you know, be humble so that you don't fall into the same sin. So it's not this gotcha or we're going to, you know, you know, ratchet you up and, you know, put, you know, the screws to your nails and stuff like that. This is a process where we're wanting to call a believer to walk right walking and to repentance and, and, and faith and, you know, restored th- yeah. those things. Well, then I think that's one reason that Matthew 18 is a command is because it's not fun. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you're going into church discipline excited or like, yeah, I mean, you've missed the, I mean, right. get, like that, that is not right. the purpose. That's not the, the intended means of doing it. You are, mm-hmm. it ought to be a heavy thing on your heart that you do because it's a commandment, not because it's fun. But it also tells us that at a prayer meeting, you need two or three people there. <laughs> You know, I was really disappointed. <laughs> so RT France is kind of the go-to for the top level, number one academic scholarly commentary on the book of Matthew. And he's got uh, an earlier one that he did from like the 80s. I've never heard of him. RT yeah, France? RT France. Hmm. Yeah. Not, not widely known. I will grant you that. But if you go to the commentary of commentaries books... Pretty much everybody says his commentary on Matthew is the best. Um, and he did it in the 80s in a shorter form. And then um, for the, I think it's the New International Greek Test Com- Greek Text Commentary Series, NIGTC, later on, he did a much larger, more expanded mm-hmm. version. 
Um, and he kind of sort of seems to take the Prayer common, meeting. yeah, the, the, you've got to have two or three <sighs> feet, you know, and I'm like, ah, he's yeah. so good in so many areas. And I get to that and I'm like, ah, why? Ah, yeah. Ah. Yeah. So if you, if you don't know, read the context of that verse, which was cited over and over again, every prayer meeting maybe multiple times when i was younger lord um, we thank you that we know wherever two or three are gathered there you are yeah yeah, yeah. this is actually saying you know if you're doing church discipline right um then god's behind you whatever you seal on earth he's going to seal in heaven and what are you going to ever undo on earth he's going to undo in heaven doesn't mean that someone's losing their salvation no it's but it it's means losing that, and binding the judgment of right that, yeah right. well and if you look at again Go to the parallel with Paul, and he tells them, I am executing judgment with you guys in spirit as if I were there with you in person. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like a direct quote of what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Right. So, yeah. All right. Um, that's all I have to say about this subject that I know of, unless you prompt me to say something else. <laughs> I feel like we should post a Forrest Gump meme. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, quite honestly, I don't think we needed two episodes for this. It, it, it is, it is to me so patently obvious on the face mm -hmm. of the pages of scripture that because God is a faithful God, the salvation that he provides for us, he also secures for us perfectly. Yeah. Um, Greg Kokel, whenever this conversation comes up, always mentions, and I've kind of alluded to it already, he'll say, you know, the question is, does blood overcome sin or does sin overcome blood? And if the blood of Christ has been shed for our sins, then... It's done. If you're covered by his blood, you're not going to be able to overpower his sacrifice. He is a great intercessor. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. Christ is currently interceding in our behalf before the Father. Yeah. And you think that you can undo that? Yeah. I mean, it. I don't want to be impatient and I don't want to be rude, but if somebody is, has studied Scripture and comes away thinking that you can lose your salvation... I mean, that's just absurd. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, let's call this one a wrap. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so we put in place a new closing tag, but we're still getting comfortable with it. Yeah. So go out and think well. Do justice. Love mercy. And walk humbly. Thanks. Bye. You've been listening to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology.